Should we start? Because I Let's. feel like everything you say will be yeah. interesting. And equally. <laughs> Thank you for coming here, Douglas Rushkoff, to be on Under the Skin. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to speak with you because I, I, I've heard you on other people's podcasts. I've watched some of your videos. I've read some of your books. And I feel a good entry point for uh, people listening that are learning of you for the uh, first time uh, will be uh, at least something that fascinated me is a description of the concept Wetico that uh, I found in your book Team Human. Yeah, Wetico is interesting. It's a... Uh, um the reason it's so interesting to me is because it shows such sympathy. When when uh, white Westerners went to uh, North America and started clear-cutting forests and killing people and enslaving people and, you know, being the way we were, the colonialist expansionary civilization we were, the Native Americans thought we had a disease, that they didn't think it was our an intrinsic problem of ours. They thought that we, were, we had a spiritual disease that they called Wetico, which was this kind of a, a cannibalism. And I started, I started to feel like that it, not only did we do this to other people, but finally we're in a place where we're doing Wetico to ourselves, where we, through technology now, we are trying to extract value from, from humans. And it's almost as if we're all now indigenous people, you know, being uh, uh, supplanted or, or in, in, enslaved is probably too strong a word, but... Mm. Uh, 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 certainly good, controlled and, and dominated by these these machines of capitalism. Yes, because it's, what I'm in, I suppose I find interesting, Douglas, is that the idea of discernment, of being able to evaluate, to determine between good and bad choices, perhaps just on a personal basis, has somehow led to uh, uh, everything being invisibly tagged with a kind of value that I feel that human beings are increasingly becoming units of energy that this cannibalizing sort of this cannibal becoming cam cannibalized this a circle of the serpent devouring its own tail seems to be being expediated by the fast pace of our technologically yeah. driven culture and it's like the opposite of the circle of life you know it, it's the opposite of the of the spiritual circle it's 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 odd and it's it's scary but you know it's it's you know in some ways it's this weird unidirectional culture that we live in that that i guess it began you know in a well-meaning way in the beginning of the judeo-christian you know uh, idea that you know we could write things down and that gave us a history and a future we kind of wrote contracts about the future the covenant with god and the torah and all we wrote down laws and we invented progress but it also it led us to sort of look at the at, at at time as this linear thing, you know, that we're going to get there to the promised land or the messianic age will come. We're going to just, you know, pedal to the metal, barrel forward and leave whatever exhaust <laughs> is going behind you as if it's back there. And what we forgot was the the pretty much every indigenous culture had a more circular uh, understanding of spirituality. They all had reincarnation, so you can't just screw somebody over now because you're going to see them again. If not this life, you'll see them in the next life. And they also had the idea that we weren't doing anything original as people, that we were just recreating or reenacting things that the gods had done already. So even if you're making love, that's just your, uh, uh, in some ways, your worship of the divine fertile, fertile energy. So if you live in a world where everything's going to come back and nothing you're doing is original, you end up with a much more uh, a, a circular, holistic understanding that everything's connected, that you can't, there's no rug to to throw something under. And that's that's sort of where we're getting now. We're at the limits. That, so we're realizing that by force rather than, than by necessity. I suppose this uh, teleological model that, that we are purpose-driven, that we are heading somewhere is underwritten by the biological realities of birth and death you know i was born i know i'm gonna die and so there's anything that or a narrative or an archetypal structure that suggests that shape purpose going forward between two points is, is resonant on the level of the individual right and then the more you're afraid of death the more you do see it as this 
end point. You know, a lot of cultures, Tibetans have kids, you know, witness death throughout their childhood. So they start to understand it as a transition or a transition rather than just this uh, finality. You know, and to the to the earlier point you made, though, you know, and, and, and I didn't even answer it. But what you were really referring to is the way that we're now treating human beings as if we have no intrinsic value, which is really, for me, the scariest part that we look at human beings uh, uh, the way the the Wetico infected people did as if th all that matters is our utility value. You know, what what are you worth to the market? What are you worth as data? What are you worth as cash? And uh, the fact that we've taken that mentality that kind of 13th century early colonial mentality and now we've digitized it and we're teaching our our algorithms to extract value from us it's it's really hard to be a human and the the most controversial thing that i'm saying and it's so odd to me certainly in the states is uh, is that human beings come in with value, that there's some essential value. It's what Mr. Rogers used to tell me when I was a kid on TV. It's, in, in America, he's a, you know, our, our, our uh, uh, children's show. He used to say, you know, you're special just the way you are. And I believed it, that, I'm, that I came in special. I don't have to, to produce something or consume something to justify my existence. And that's not the way it feels anymore. Do you really feel like that? I have to. Like, did you have a, like, did your parents, I mean, I reckon Mr. Rogers, I've heard of him, and yeah. that, I think Jim Rogers, uh, Jim Carrey played him in a film. Like, um, but because I think a lot of people, the reason perhaps we're so susceptible to a model that it, it, it prioritizes external values and, and utility is because uh, I myself felt like if I'm not successful, I'm not valuable. If I don't overcome the conditions of my, you know, I don't know, childhood, or mm. if I don't conform to an idea of what a successful man is supposed to look like, then I, I won't be able to live with myself. And, and you, you didn't feel that. I mean, I guess I, you know, if I'm honest, I probably did. You know, and psychologically, when I think about the way I felt as a child, I felt like I was, I came in on the party was already started. You know, I had an older brother and a family, and I felt like, yeah, what, like, like I came in at a deficit in yeah. some ways, you know? It's like, well, little Douglas, what's he, <laughs> what's, what's he bringing here? <laughs> what are you bringing? You're bringing a lot of insight and yeah. twinkle, as far as I can gather. <laughs> You're a twinkling man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pattern recognition is what I guess what I do. Oh. Yeah. Because that's integral to intelligence, isn't it? The ability to acknowledge and identify patterns. I think it might be an essential quality of, like, even if you're an athlete and you can spot patterns in a game, or you're a mathematician, obviously, or a comedian, or whatever field you're working in, the ability to go preempt patterns, potential patterns from patterns previously observed is a great right. marker of intelligence. Tell me what you feel, Douglas, might be the uh, the way things are shaping up if we are indeed applying this uh, 13th century, was it colonial mentality to like a, a new space? Because one of the things I thought when I hear people talk about the internet uh, uh, is that in a, it's in a way entirely uh, conforming to the ideas that preceded it in the way that the space is becoming corporatized uh, and, and the, the, in use it is what we would anticipate. Yeah, I mean, when the internet first started, I mean, and I was around for that. I mean, and I was friends with um, the kind of the psychedelic California crowd at that point. I was, you know, friends with Timothy Leary and, uh, uh, you know, Howard Rheingold and, and the, the, the folks who really saw in the internet a way to turn on everybody. You know, we couldn't get everyone to take acid because it's acid and it's hard, but get everyone on the internet and they'll have that all is one connected experience. So at the dawn of the internet age, we believed that we were in the midst of a renaissance, that, that people, human beings connected would be able to generate a new reality i mean everything was from from the gaia hypothesis and fantasy role-playing games and rave music and uh it and and new physics it really seemed like this was it we're gonna upscale civilization but then you know wired magazine came along and said oh no no this this they called it a revolution instead of a renaissance they said it's all about disruption but they really it wasn't disrupting anything. What they were saying was, don't worry, the internet's going to come, but it's going to be the poster child for the NASDAQ stock exchange, that this is the new growth area. They, they published a book called The Long Boom, where they said that thanks to the internet, the economy will grow exponentially forever. 
That's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's no consequences. <laughs> right. And and so what did we do? We we you know like every little dot com pivot, we pivoted the whole internet to growth to growth based economics. So instead of having a digital age, we had, you know, what they're calling a second or a fourth industrial age. And that's not what we need. When you take industrialism and supercharge it with the sort of digital steroids, you're going to just burn out the whole the whole place. How do we counter this narrative of progressivism? Because I suppose it's allied to some ideas that are quite perhaps you could say important around uh, identity politics uh, but you know i know it's seemingly most relevant in the field of economics that you can't have limitless progress limitless growth on a finite space mm -hmm. with finite resources but how do we interrupt something that seems so human when you talked a minute ago about like we used to have a pantheonistic understanding of ourselves as an expression of some pre-existing reality as demonstrated by our myths and our gods but now we see ourselves as somehow purposefully grinding out into some future never looking back like i i, I don't I wonder how we can, even with the internet, even with the communicative tools at our disposal, even with people that, you know, with this new psychedelic age that are having these in intuitive um, spiritual experiences, how, how do we interrupt this idea of progression? How do we? Well, there's, I mean, there's more than one kind of progress. You know, there's the growth-based capitalism progress, which is... We've got to grow our company, you know, you, you go to uh, companies making billions of dollars are not allowed to just make billions of dollars. They have to make more billions the next year than they did this year. You know, so that's uh, the, uh, an economic, uh, it's an economic problem. I think part of it is we have to change how we understand development. And you can, you know, people say, oh, you just want to go back in time. It's like, no, mm. no, no. I don't want to go back in time, but I want us to think of development more, more, more as an iteration or as a, a almost more as a, a spiral. You can have, uh, uh, you can have a civilization develop without it taking more land from people <laughs> or, 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 or in growing its population. You, know, you can still develop, you know, a, a sense of identity, a sense of connection with other people. I mean, even if we just decided as a civilization, we want to figure out how to um, replace industrial agriculture with permaculture, say. That would be a hard one, but it would be great, wouldn't it? It would say, oh, it turns out it's more labor intensive and mm. we're going to use less machines. It turns out we don't want Monsanto to figure out how to yeah. grow alfalfa on a rock. You know, we want to actually uh, regenerate living soil before it's gone in the next 60 years. So there's, it's a different kind of progress. It's sort of more an iterative, regenerative um, understanding of progress. So you're not, and it, it's interesting. I mean, I've only gotten there now in my 50s to realize... I'm not striving towards something. It doesn't mean I'm not working. I'm just not, what do I, I mean, it's like, I'm not here. I'm like, I'm here. I'm here with you doing this thing. I mean, this is, this is the, not the, 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 this is the reason why I wrote the book. I'm not here to sell. This is not to the utilitarian, don't tell my publicist. I'm not here for the utilitarian purpose of selling my book. I wrote the book, if anything, to be here. But I didn't even. I wrote the book to write the book, and now I'm here to be here. And that, am I developing? Have I given up or something? I'm growing more as a person with that non-striving attitude than I would if it's like, okay, now I'm building my Rushkoff empire. <laughs> What's next? Where's the Rushkoff <laughs> empire we were promised? <laughs> You see, uh, so all right, so you feel like there are some universal principles here because it's applicable to you as an individual with your own career as a, a writer and an academic and a, a teacher. And it's also applicable in that it could provide new models for how to approach agriculture. But if we focus for a moment on that example, which is a fantastic one, obviously, you, you mentioned that you in... Uh, trying to replace industrial agriculture with permaculture, which would definitely be better for the world, definitely create loads of jobs, definitely reduce pollution. Um, it would also, uh, 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 and uh, significantly, it would affect the interests of Monsanto and the powerful. And that obstacle is very, very hard to overcome. Impossible in recent history, isn't it? Like, no, what the, the... See, when I think about the way things are, I think 
who uh, benefits from things remaining like this and not changing and it's obviously the most powerful people because the most powerful institutions that determine how re reality is for mm -hmm. them it's not broken for them it's fine you mentioned in your book that you know sort of billionaires are working on their bunkers for the post-apocalyptic <laughs> hell that they're inducing right. so h how do we uh, people that feel that we would like to oppose that particular version of progress how do we challenge those interests? I mean, we Thanks. a number of ways. Uh, first, I love that you use the word oppose as opposed to resist, because resistance feels to me like a, a, a relic of the electronic age when we had, you know, rheostats and resistors and things. There are no resistors in digital. It's just either on or off. You know, you don't you can't attenuate digital. You actually do have to oppose it. And I feel like the way we oppose it is and no one likes to hear this, but is with distributed local solutions. You know, there is uh, uh, there is no sort of one size fits all. Oh, let's elect this one president, or let's implement that mm. this policy or that. I mean, there's some economic policies you could punish capital gains rather than punishing dividends, so that shareholders don't want just growth in their stocks, but they want. Uh, continuing revenue because they've cracked that game though haven't they, they they've have. cracked anything that exists within those institutions and those systems they know how to manage lobby and uh, direct those processes right so anything you do at scale ends up uh, subject to their to their rules which is why then you have to try to do it not at scale and have enough people doing it that they can no longer you know no longer stop us are you a lecturer at columbia university no at, at city university of new york what is it? city, at city yeah. university yeah it's public your... school yeah oh, i see um are you an anarcho-syndicalist I am. I didn't know what it was. Because uh, I've been saying I'm one for a while. Yeah. And I'd love someone to explain it. I know. Well, I was I was in a, like a debate with like real academics in uh, about like economics in Germany. And someone said, why, you sound like an anarcho-syndicalist. <laughs> and I was like, um, so I that night I went to the hotel and looked on Wikipedia. And I was like, oh, what is this terrible insult? <laughs> and I started reading with the entry. And I was like, oh, this is what i'm saying yeah so i'd really i'm i mean it's possible they were really evil ones or something that, that i don't know about <laughs> but but anarcho-syndicalism as i understand it is basically that the whole world is made up as much as possible of many small cottage industries cottage businesses that are networked together so it's it's really uh, uh it's consonant with what the popes were arguing after uh, after marx they argued for something called distributism you know, did they, they? They did. They were asked. The popes were asked. So Marx came out and he said all this about the worker. What is the Catholic Church? What's your position on Marx? And they said, well, you know, they don't, the capitalists deserve to make money on a business, but the workers deserve to be fairly compensated. So what we think is rather than redistributing the spoils of capitalism after the fact, let's pre-distribute the means of production before the fact. So they believe that workers should own the means of production, like a platform cooperative. What what if the, the Uber drivers owned Uber? Then instead of simply doing the R&D, the research and development for their robot replacements, they're <laughs> doing R&D for their own company. So then when the robots replace them, they'll sit back and earn the revenue on the company that they built with their driving and their knowledge. So anarcho-syndicalism is kind of like that. It's like if if you don't grow businesses large for their for its own sake, you just grow a business as big as it has to be to do what it does. So if you open a pizzeria and you're serving your town and the next town wants a pizzeria, you go, oh, start it. Here's my recipe. Go start a pizzeria. And once there are all these different pizzerias, you end up in a network and you can support each other in ways better uh, and live a better life. You get to make pizza instead of being the manager of some pizza chain. You know, you get yeah. to do what you do. You possibly you'd get some time off as well. Go do your activities. You know, like I'll go for a walk or some fishing or do some jujitsu or do some arrangements yeah. with dry flowers, some crafts instead of like, oh God, make another pizzeria. I'll kill that guy yeah. that took my recipes. Well, you have to now, but you have to grow in order to stay alive at this point. If you've taken, certainly if you've taken any investment, you have to keep growing or the rents are going up or there's a Jamba Juice going next door and now your rent is up. I was looking at the high street and I thought like how hard it must be to start a business, you know, like, you know, the ones that are not yeah. identifiable chains, they're just businesses like someone's nail bar or whatever and 
I was thinking, God, I bet these people are all in heavy debt in actuality. I bet each one of these units represents a great deal of debt. And it's precisely because that, that rather brilliant PayPal model wasn't taken up that the means of production is are, are controlled by the capitalists and the workers get their share of the spoils after the fact. You know that thing that Gandhi said prior to the independence of uh, India? He said, like, there's no point in us getting India independent then replicating the colonial model that we've just fought to throw off it's a country of 70,000 villages each of which we should be independent run on its own craft based mm-hmm. or uh, like a or like economies and we should only trade with each other where necessary and this is how it should be like you know so he, that's anarcho syndicalism as yeah. well yeah and part of what digital did was it helped us see that the the nation state was itself a fiction it's just made up isn't it what well, really is though i mean there were cities were real because those are sort of cities are sort of like humans like termite mounds you know we grew organisms coral Exactly, like a coral reef is a city, but the nation state, the nation state was invented. There's this moment I keep going back to in most of my books when the the end of the medieval era, people were getting wealthy. They had they had just done the crusades. They came back from the crusades. They opened up the, the equivalent of the Moorish bazaar that we called the market. We brought uh, uh, local currencies that were issued in the morning and they would expire in the evening. So they were optimized for the velocity of money. And the middle class got wealthy. That's what they called the bourgeois, the burghers became the bourgeois. And the aristocracy had to figure out how do we squash this renaissance? So they invented chartered monopolies, which said nobody's allowed to do business in an industry unless they are chartered by the king. So now you have to, instead of making shoes and selling them, you've got to work for his majesty's royal shoemaker. Now you're an employee selling your time instead of creating value. The second thing they came up with was central currency. All the local currencies were made illegal, and now you had to borrow money from a central treasury at interest in order to transact. And if you have to borrow at interest, it means that you've got to pay back more than you borrowed, which means now the economy has to grow. And we've been living with that, you know, 11th, 12th, 13th century economic operating system for close to a thousand years. And now we're going into a digital age using that OS, and we're telling all our algorithms, all our platforms, this is how the economy works. So look what happens. You know, humanity can't survive uh, uh, digital capitalism at this at this pace. And we're kind of told that it's nature, that it's an expression of an absolute truth, that it's not a simply a variant, one of many alternatives. And the, generally speaking, the people that want you to think there are no alternatives are the people that benefit from things things staying the, the same way. But right. that, you've described it's not nature. sort of a lovely utopia. It's not nature. <laughs> It's just an idea. It is. I mean, and then, you know, certain free market libertarians will say, oh, well, Darwin showed us that reality is survival of the fittest individual. And Darwin didn't write that at all. Darwin was writing about the different species ability to coordinate and collaborate amongst each other and and with the other ones in order to to survive and thrive. You know, we know I, I was taught in school that trees would compete for sunlight and the big one would shade the little one and then the little one would die. It's like, it's not what happens at all. Trees are actually sharing resources under the ground through a network of mycelia. So the big tree that's getting sun is passing its nutrients to the little one. Then when the leaves fall off the big one, the little one's an evergreen and it sends nutrients back to the big one. And then the mushrooms are taking a service fee for the transaction. I'll send you some nutrients, but when the leaves <laughs> fall, would you be so kind as to send some... Of course I will, big guy! <laughs> hey, fuck you! <laughs> like, it's te- yeah, that, how, how beautiful. Like, you know, um, that, so, yes, we narrativize uh, nature, biology, in order to fit in with a pre-existing economic ideology. Right. Here's a little one that, in our country. We had these things, the red squirrels. Oh, we loved the red squirrels. Lovely little things they were, bushy tails red. And then, like, uh, the American squirrel <laughs> came over here on boats and killed the red squirrel. Oh, now there did. are no red squirrels. Sorry. La- later, yeah, <laughs> later, though, we, we discovered that actually what happened is that there'd been, like, loads of disruption of the red squirrel's environments, like, right. through development. And, and it was just a sort of a contributory, secondary ancillary factor that there had been this other competing right. group of squirrels i.e. an immigrant narrative was utilized because it sort of is quite it's resonant like that and the fact that you would be taught you know like a sort of biology in that way or a horticulture or whatever particular discipline yeah. that would be like with those kind of biases shows you how 
entrenched these ideas are. Right, but that's in some ways that's why I'm trying this time I'm trying to offer a different approach to cure. In other words, that that it's really easy to jump into this almost allopathic model of society. Like, oh, what's the disease? The disease is capitalism. The disease is Trump. The disease is right wing. The disease is and or the disease is computers and digital. So let's just go off digital because, oh, they're so bad and they're hurt. It's like, well, wait a minute. What about looking at the, the vitality of the patient instead? So rather than coming up with a new algorithm to filter dangerous weaponized memes from my teen's Instagram account, what if I just make my teen and our culture more resilient to this? What if we, you know, so I'm trying to kind of promote our humanity so we're we're less vulnerable to this, to the insanity rather than looking at the insanity as the, as the, the problem to be fixed. Yeah, you might be right about that. So how then do we promote the vitality of the patient? Well, first, um, by building up I mean, it sounds, it starts to sound sad, but by building up our tolerance for being with each other, you know, I get um, every year, I've only been teaching now like five years and or this is the fifth year. And every year, every semester, I get more notes on the first day of class from kids whose psychotherapists have given them a note saying, um, please excuse Johnny from class presentations because he's got too much anxiety to stand. How old are they? College age. What's that, 18? Yeah, 18 to 22. And I think, you know, wow. I mean, what they needed was a public school system that didn't look at itself as increasing little workers' utility value. You know, there's all these principals and and, and heads of universities that are meeting with CEOs to find out what do you uh, what do you want your workers to know? Do you want them to know Excel? Do you want them to know Python or Java? And then they go into the classroom and teach the things that the companies want, which is the opposite purpose of public education, right? Public education was for the coal worker to have some dignity, you know, so that he could go home at night after working all day and be able to appreciate a novel or participate in democracy. And now it's uh, an externalized cost of of companies. So uh, we throw, you know, iPads and God knows what in the classroom. I think, you know, we've got to reacquaint ourselves with one another. Take, if you can, 10, 15 minutes a week and sit with another person, you know, learn to make eye contact again. Don't expect to, to have your, your mirror neurons fire or your oxytocin released by staring at someone on, on, a, on a FaceTime or Skype video. You know, that there's, uh, uh, I mean, gosh, being in a room, making contact with a person is, it leverages 500,000 years of evolution that, that, that does increase your vitality. So that's why, I mean, that's, was the whole team, uh, you know, the whole team idea is to help people understand that being human is a team sport and that being social is when you get healthy, that that's, that that's, that's what it is. And these, these imitation forms of, of, of social life are basically like porn is to sex. You know, it's really not the same thing and it's not, uh, uh, it's not enhancing our, it's not building solidarity. It's not giving us the power we need to combat what we have to fight. It, it compounds the condition, the conditions that make us easily manipulated into little solitary units of energy. Also, my own uh, fear growing up and sort of feelings of inadequacy meant that I would kind of welcome uh, uh, like uh, isolated environments. I was pretty scared of people sometimes and being in groups, but I recognise how necessary it is. The thing I've been uh, I've been thinking uh, a lot, Douglas, is that to a point, and again, this is not to uh fetishize nostalgia or a kind of uh, like a harking back but where possible if we recreate indigenous conditions simply like if we don't eat f- uh, synthesized food and we eat food that's uh, like available at the right time of year in the right quantities that's been naturally produced permaculture etc then that's healthy for us and if we have relationships with about a hundred people and we spend some time involved in community based tasks as opposed to always individualistic tasks we're somehow replicating the conditions for which we uh, were designed stroke evolved and 
increasingly we don't increasingly we have become ourselves industrialized agriculturalized we've become little units of energy to be farmed out for um, we don't have much where do we engage now with our individual human agency our ability to bond, be spontaneous our ability to be in an eternal present what institutions exist that encourage it what is our route back to that what could possibly ever challenge this sort of fast moving juggernaut that we're all being sort of crushed by if we're not riding it it's funny i'd never thought about it in terms of institutions i mean in some ways you know our religious institutions do that you know if you stand in a church or synagogue and you're singing with other people um you know for me my uh, yoga class is one of those places you know where i'm actually in a room with these same dozen people you know a bunch of times a week and it starts to feel like we're we're uh, part of a little networked organism i mean in a certain way it's easier than than a lot of people even now they'll come to me and say oh where can we go do team human we should start team human meetups and team human clubs and team human this and i'm like well all we it's already the people are here you know? <laughs> it's like that i'm not asking for people to join my team human it's just i mean like the human race you know join <laughs> get rid of those other bloody humans yeah. i hate them but you can do it i mean in the streets of new york i started to play this game now where i walk when i'm ever walking in the city and everybody's staring in their phones i try to find someone else who's not and then make that almost like it's part of a conspiracy like the secret eye contact like oh there's another one you're you're, hey, you're awake too. Oh my God, look at them. Look at them. It's just like, I remember because when I went back when I was a little kind of hippie rave kid, you'd see someone on the street who'd been at the rave the night before. And it's like, oh, we're, you know, hey. I see, I saw you. Uh, so it's a little bit of that. But I mean, I think it's as simple as that. It's it's taking the places where we where we already congregate and using using them or getting just getting off the machine and and feeling OK about not accomplishing anything other than you know, uh, sacred contact with other, with other people. So, uh, you know, and there's, there's also, I mean, there's so many ways to, to try to change the world without starting a whole new thing. Also, there's, there's still school boards and town boards and land use meetings and those, those town meetings that only crazy people go to. Well, we yeah. can, we can go to them too. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. I see it now. Democracy pure democracy is time consuming i'm involved in a few things that require democracy and it's counterintuitive it's not like my nature is you know even though my ideology is we're all the same we should find fully autonomous communities and collectives where people are as close to the powers that govern their lives as possible people should be in charge of their places of work people should be in charge of their communities people shouldn't be tyrannized by abstract economic ideas that prohibit them from being human in the purest ways but if you put me in a room full of people i find subtle ways to dominate them yeah. and to take all of the attention well, right but at least you know hopefully that that you're playing a game you know that it's this is this is our game that we're playing above uh, uh an essentially loving connected you know reality that we're that we're in the the other problem with when we describe you know this this return to uh, uh return to ground you know to actual local living is uh well, when, when, you know, the Wall Street Journal or someone reviews a book of mine that's arguing for that, they'll say, oh, look, he wants to go back in time. He wants to take us back to the Middle Ages. And it was worse then. It's like, no, there's a difference between kind of uh, 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 going back and, and retrieval. What I'm asking is that we bring forward the technologies, the sciences, the wisdoms that we've left behind. Yes, and that's most disingenuous criticism because actually their ideology, as you have explained, and I'm going to take you at your word, was created and cultivated precisely then and has just been perpetuating itself in modernity, are officially held up necessarily right. in recent history through, you know, what was that thing where they have to inject the, you know, like uh, it sounds like artificial insemination, but it's with money. <laughs> oh, quantitative yeah, qu easing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Right, which is basically reactionary, not disruptive or productive or future oriented at all. They're trying to they're really trying they're trying to keep in place the operating system that the lords of feudalism <laughs> imported in order to prevent 
free market economics from destroying them. And the people that they quote, if they just don't read them, read Marx, read Adam Smith. Adam Smith's whole thing was don't let big corporations destroy the economy. We've got to keep it small. We've got to keep it local. You know, so and and you see the economist talking about him as if he's arguing for libertarianism. But now, now we, um, you know, we've sort of we've skipped over it a little bit, but we feel like the nation state <laughs> is possibly not the answer or that it's a construct. What possible institutional entity could be big enough to challenge corporate interests on that scale? What could where how could rec uh, uh, regulation be leveraged? I mean, the biggest the 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 biggest uh, uh, opponent we can we can structure would be humanity itself. You know, if people can uh, get out of the survivalist consumerist mindset, you know, right now, most of us and even the billionaires are they're trying to earn enough money so they can insulate themselves from the world. Yeah, that's my plan. <laughs> you can't. And with the billionaires, they're trying to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the problems that they're creating by earning money in that way. Yeah. And that's a they're never going to they're never going to do it. That's why they're asking me, you know, where to put their bomb shelters or their their fallout shelters or how to maintain control of their security force after uh, after the event that they're <laughs> they, they, now, we've realized that the security force will not be as incentivized when the economy collapses <laughs> and money's meaningless. And they might realize that it was us that caused this right. and turn on us. So what do we do? Right. What do we do? It's like, dude, you New fucked Zealand. Up. <laughs> <laughs> no, we kept, we kept there. So they're they're in zombie. <laughs> you up. They're, they did. They're they're in zombie apocalypse mode right now. You know, and that's um, that's not. That's why they're they're in such an unhappy place. But I think everybody's in zombie apocalypse mode. Everybody's looking down down that that at that really dark uh, that dark future. So it's a whole uh, uh, it's a whole energetic shift really in the way people approach their their lives it's just hard it's hard to stay alive right now it's hard to to make a living to pay your rent one of the things i feel encouraged by is that all of these systems at some point have passed through and been born of the you know humans human consciousness or whatever precedes human consciousness or you know that you know every idea has been transmitted through human beings other than mm -hmm. meteorology like but like so you know, there, there is an access point to change and it's the consciousness of individuals. You talk about, uh, there's two things I'd like to sort of uh, lump together, like your interest in psychedelics, DMT, etc., and your notion of awe and the significance of awe. As, and I wonder if this is some pivotal point in human consciousness that could be a, a sort of fertile place for transformation. Yeah, I mean... A lot of it, for me, has to do with understanding what makes human beings different from machines. You know, because in the in the in my digital communities, there's a lot of people who think that humans are about to be obsolete, and we should just upload consciousness to a chip or accept that robots are our successor and pass the evolutionary torch to the to the machines. So I started thinking about well, what makes humans different. And one of the things that's special about humans is that we can experience awe, that we can just be blown away by something and how different that is from this sort of uncanny valley feeling of uh, almost vertigo that we can have in a digital experience or trying to watch a uh, like a toy story kind of a movie sometimes when the characters are just a little too close to being human you get that uncanny valley you know kind of experience that's the way most people get their awe now is by slapping on some vr goggle not the awe of of what is that? You know, and even in the book, I talked about the, the moment that a dog, when you do something it doesn't understand and it kind of, <laughs> that, that that's, we, we love that because we see ourselves in that. It's that, you know, that your it's a little mind is being blown. It's a little, huh? You know that that sense of of of, of changing context. All of a sudden, you don't know what what reality tunnel am I am I in, and which am I going to use? I mean, that's the sort of the beauty of uh, at least the the psychedelic experience. And I don't know, uh, you know, a psychedelic experience is is artificial in a certain sense, and that you're you're taking something to get there. But it's also the experience when you know the the birth of a child or seeing a vista. You 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 get filled with something and then uh, as we know now the your your 
awe, in, the experience of awe increases your immune response, and it's so much, uh, uh, you get so much strength, you, you experience more empathy after, if you have awe, and then you see someone in pain, or someone in another situation, you end up with more empathy for them, so awe, to me, seems to be an essential human opening experience, but, you know, the, the day-to-day life that we've created for ourselves is almost anathema to awe. Yes. Curiously and ironically, the word awesome has become profligate and, and, and abundant at the time that awe itself has been extra- extracted from our human experience. I think of uh, some ideas I heard in situationism mm. and uh, right now de Boer, the idea of the spectacle that we participate in reality as consumers or as workers, but we are not invited to participate in reality in a spontaneous way as authors of our own reality. I think that this idea of awe, you know, whether it's a, 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 a induced through nature or through art or through religion or through psychedelic is the sort of sudden uh, awareness that reality as I previously understood it was limited and it hints at realms that I am not usually able to access because of the limitations of my individuated consciousness and to sort of taste that to hold that and one in my experience you I can only hold it for a moment recontextualizes my previous reality and indeed the systems that we allow to govern right. us in- right and it also awakens you to the idea that these institutions are not creating your reality for you. They're convincing you to create the reality that they want you to create, but we are still actively creating our reality. You know, it's like when I've had I've had friends who've been in cults and oh. I'll try to get them out of a cult. And when and I've gotten a few out and a couple I have. <laughs> are your friends all joining yeah, cults? Not all, but there was a time Seems when I was that too many, Douglas. Yeah, well, in the in 1980s my friends were actors. <laughs> 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 Fuck this, I'm going to join a cult. <laughs> Well, you know, and they had the Namyoho Renge Kyo thing that they would put the, you know, to get the new, you know, to get a job, you would chant for it. And But with most of them, they would think that the cult leader had some power over them. And the way I would try to help them get out is like, no, 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 this guy's not special in any way. It's it's you. You. I mean, once you take responsibility for I did this, I did that, I did this, I fell for this, that guy wasn't nice, but I still fell for it. Um then you can get yourself out of it. And I feel that's sort of the trick with capitalism too. Although there's still all of these structures, at least if we wake up to this, um, the, the rat race that we've bought into, you know, then we can start to say, well, what can I start to do other differently? And then you realize, well, there's nothing I can do, but if I turn to the others, maybe there's something we can do. And that's why we got to do it. Uh, Solidarity is the prerequisite to uh, any kind of a revolution or, or renaissance. Yeah, as individuals, our power is yeah, it's, it's nil. It's, it's nil. I like that um, motif. Find the others. Can you tell me the st- story which is in your book? Yeah, well, it's funny because find the others. It was a, another Timothy Leary story. It oh, was cool. In the like 1968, he did a series of lectures at Berkeley. And this young woman got up after the lecture and she said, uh, asked him a question. I've had the psychedelic experience. I've seen how everything's connected. What do I do now? And he said, find the others. And it was beautiful in, in the sense he meant find the other people who've had that experience and start to, you know, gather and share and talk about it. And I mean it that way. But then I also really mean find the others, you know, look for the humanity in the eyes of the person wearing the MAGA hat or the, the, the you know, the, the there's an angry Brexiter that you don't like. Or, you know, find the human there because they're human too. You know, I, I was, was, someone was saying, how can I, you know, like the, the, the person who hates the Mexican immigrants? How can I like the person who's, you know, wants to build a wall? So, well, if you can't see the humanity in the person who wants to build the wall, how do you expect them to see the humanity in the supposed Mexican on the other side of the wall? All we're discussing at that point is aesthetics. Like, you know, I don't like their intolerance, my intolerance. Is like, <laughs> you know, like it's a, it's sort of a kind of Christian idea, but I think, or at least that's one of the ways it was popularized, yeah. but like this obligation to love, this obligation to understand. I've been thinking about this, Douglas. I've been thinking like morality and ethics are something for yourself not something to 
pillory other people with if like you know if you want to be vegan be vegan if you want whatever it is you want to be but like this kind of like this personal expansion expansionism this outrage this condemnation yeah I, exactly yeah. social justice on capital stero- capitalist steroids yeah yeah, that, yeah. it's a, like well, what's its end point it feels like it's in its end point like it's what we want to do is this we want to complain and condemn others there's no vision for right. this is what we would like to create. These are the kind of cultures that we see succeeding. When you <laughs> talk about um, this sort of anarcho syndicalism, and it was roughly what I thought it would be, thank God, because I've been <laughs> telling people I am one and telling people they should be one also. So it's good to know yeah. that it's not the Nazis, <laughs> <laughs> right, for example. Oh, it's like the Nazis were them. Oh, oh God. Oh, no, that was terrible. Um, like, I, I feel that. There is so much variation within humanity. Of course, there, you know, we have the, the important things are in common, the same as we would recognize biologically from our organs and our hormones. We are basically the same, you know, but there is so much variation socially and culturally. It seems ridiculous to ask people to live in, if not arbitrary, then n- n- not, n- not truthfully integrated communities of 60 million people called England or 300 million people called America. It seems like that, you know, unless that idea is serving you, the idea of England and I love it I love mm. the England football team I love the flag I love the pageantry in history I love so much of that I love America I love blue jeans McDonald's Jimi Hendrix so much I love but if it's not helping people now why would we continue to believe in these systems that are only tools for our oppression instead we should create smaller communities where we are where we have personal authority and govern mm. our own Right. But you can't take it away from people all at once. No. So what I'm thinking is you sort of go England. (laughs) (laughs) Right. We're in England. All right. And now we're in America. Okay. I'm a white guy. And, you know, so all of these, all of these divisions are, are, uh, they're concepts, but they're not, they're not real. I mean, and and we can go back and, you know, and I tried to do that. I thought, okay, I'm going to denaturalize the corporation, denaturalize central currency, denaturalize the nation state. What does that mean? By show that they're not conditions of nature. They're construct. They're invented. You know, and that, okay, here were these cities and here was this moment that this lord said, oh, no, now there's this barrier. But we know that they're breaking down. That's why they're building a wall between America and Mexico, you know, or, or, or U.S. and Mexico. Because it's like... You, if without the wall, the boundary doesn't exist. That's why, I mean, nothing, I mean, this is not political, but that's why we have to do something like Brexit and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We still, we're still here. You know, we, this. Even semantically, if you have to call something the United Kingdom or the United <laughs> States, there's an implication that that needs to be verbally imposed because, you know, the Welsh people, previously Irish people, Scottish people want to run their own communities. And yes, devolution, in a sense, has, I feel like it's a positive thing. It is, in a way. The interesting thing is who some people back some of these ideas for. Oh, weird really? reasons you know so i mean it's funny because i hear sometimes i'll hear like a donald trump's policies and i'll say well you know if i'm going to be totally fair at the wto protests in seattle the world trade organization protest we were kind of saying the same thing right there's a global conspiracy and the neoliberalism has got to be broken and we should return to local businesses and reestablish national boundaries and it was like huh so watch what you wish for you know yeah that's curious isn't it because yeah he is an an unusual and he seems like anathema but my other what i think is he it can't be that significant otherwise it wouldn't be happening it can't be interrupting or disrupting the interests of the truly powerful it can't be spiking or uh, sort of uh, annihilating real interest because constitutionally institutionally things are sort of basically the same i know it's not a very nice wallpaper but yeah. I, I i can't see how it's different other than being sort of a grotesque exaggeration right. of what was previously there yeah i mean in some sense he just jumped into a standing wave you know that was that was something that was coming uh, in some yeah, sense yeah. anyway i don't see him as as a conscious actor <laughs> no. in, in any of this he doesn't he seems to be reading scripts and yelling at people you know? in fact that whole idea of conscious actors even when you look at recent history it's kind of evident that so many 
trends and factors are at play when something even seeming, seemingly extreme, such as you know Nazism or communism in the uh, Soviet Union, it seems that like so many things were happening. They say, oh, okay, okay, that sort of makes sense. It wasn't one sort of evil Machiavelli rose to the top and tricked everybody. It's like a standing wave. Like it I feels know, like that. it would be so comforting if it was just a Doctor Evil, you yes. know, <laughs> doing the thing rather than some giant kind of systemic. Uh, uh, thing but if it is a giant systemic thing then we can change that you know and it's not it's so crazy optimistic to think that human beings can rise to the occasion of our own survival what do you think would happen if if uh, people did start to run autonomous organizations uh, like to collectivize say I don't know initially it's businesses schools hospitals and then I suppose a component of that would be you would necessarily end up breaking the law because you'd say we can't afford to pay tax anymore to this centralized institution that we don't agree with like, well, if people did even the, the, the smallest steps towards that kind of uh, economic autonomy, it would throw the macro economy into a recession instantly. I mean, if people just took Sabbath one, you know, one seventh of their time to not buy and sell anything, that would throw everyone into a recession. We're all consuming so much. So I, I feel like what the way we take power back is by deflating the whole corporate landscape. And we do that by just by buying less, you know, by by sharing more. You know, in, in America, everybody's got, you know, in the suburbs, everyone has their own lawnmower. It's like, why do they all have their own lawnmower? Yeah. You know, and I understand if we only have one lawnmower for the block, which is all we need, then people who work at the lawnmower company are gonna lose their jobs. And old ladies who have lawnmower stock are not gonna get their dividends, you know? And so there will be disruption, but it's the only way to un to unwind this thing. but. Uh, but those lawnmower guys, they're losing their job anyway with, with AI. And the old lady would benefit from a, a communal system where people had a civic identity, where right. they maybe mow other people's lawns. It's like those values seem... I feel like one of the places that... The, the, one of the only places where those values have been insulated is within, within religious communities. And I know there's so much complexity and... Ob and there are many obvious problems with religious identity, and, uh, but it seems as well that because, precisely because it's not, at least from some perspectives, economically led, it houses a lot of human truth. Right, and and the interesting thing is when when it's if we think about this sort of sharing economy, uh, in the in the traditional economic terms then then like evolutionary theorists would call it reciprocal altruism yeah. that we're doing oh, yeah, this yeah. all for our mutual self-interest and because i you know, i'll take care of your child because i know someday that my child might need your what about love <laughs> what about love what about i do it because i love you know i love doing stuff the the interesting thing is you know most of the communities i talk to about this the resistance is not that people are not willing to share the resistance is people are not willing to accept the favor People are afraid, you know, the, 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 you know, you don't let the old lady just teach you how to breastfeed. You hire the lactation consultant from the professional, you know, company. You don't, uh, uh, because you're going to owe this lady something. She's going to want to come in and sing Christmas carols or something with you in Christmas time. But it's like the stuff that we, you know. <laughs> just because I let you teach me how to breastfeed, <laughs> you're not coming in here singing, cooking, <laughs> wenchless. Fuck off. <laughs> well, really, but it is. And it's like all these experiences that we don't want to have are the things that we watch TV and wish we had. You know, that that's all the sitcom things that they do are stuff we don't do. And so it's just, it's insane right we need to create simulations of community simulations of connection because we've become afraid of human connection we've become afraid of the meat and stench and wet and unreliability of humans right and that's why we prefer the the, the robot maid the robot girlfriend the robot teacher to the human being but it's that precisely that stuff that we're trying to iron out uh that's the stuff that makes us most human. I mean, my main critique of social media is that the way it works now is they're, they're, they use data about our past to put us in statistical buckets and then try to get us to behave true to our statistical profile. 
So they, you, if, if you're if you're you know 80 percent likely to go on a diet in the next you know two months, then all of a sudden your Facebook feed will start to have you know oh you're looking kind of fat or this is what the veins of a person looks like who's not eating proper food, and they're not just doing that to try to sell you a particular diet. They're doing that to get you make sure you behave true to your statistical profile to get that 80 percent accuracy up to 90 percent or 95 percent. But for me, it's that 20 percent of people who we're not going to go on a diet, who we're going to do something else. That's the weird anomalous behavior. That's the messy, sticky, unpredictable stuff that makes us actually human. Talk about more, please, Douglas, this uneasy relationship between the users of social media and the objectives and intentions of social media corporations. Like there's uh, somewhere one of your some of your content I saw you say that a 15 year old kid using Facebook is using it to get friends, but that is not what they're discussing at Facebook HQ. Of like, how can we make people have more friends? And so yeah, right, they're really thinking that right. Oh, the poor Johnny needs more friends. How can we really make those more enduring bonds? <laughs> how can we really help him meet girls and get over these you know. Uh, obstacles. No, they're thinking, how do we monetize Johnny's social graph, right? How do we make money off Johnny and how do we make him a more predictable actor? You know, and then, you know, it's funny, I, I was just thinking about uh, algorithms as as demons. You how? Know, like, think about, we make these, we program these little things to understand our weaknesses, to figure out our exploits, and then leverage them in order to get us to do things against our own best interests automatically. That's like the definition of a demon, <laughs> you know? And here we are, we've made them, we created them. It's interesting when you find that, um, as you've just done, perfect analogies for modern phenomena, in the same way uh, that I find it interesting that in ancient, technologies there are solution to modern problems and i'm always disappointed i know you went on sam harris's uh, podcast and i've spent time with sam harris also but there is a sort of a trend to extract spiritual principles from their theological origins and i feel that this is not good it's not and you know and and i guess i really uh, i mean i've gone to through a bunch of different religions, I guess, you know, I mean, but, but th this book has forced me to kind of come out of the closet as someone who believes in the soul, mm. you know, that, 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 you know, I was thinking a lot about Aristotle and, you know, Aristotle as compared to Plato, Plato kind of divided. There's like the perfect like ideals up there. And then there's physical reality. And we've lived with, we love Plato because then we can say, okay, you just go to church for that uh -huh. upper stuff and everything's mechanical. We can, you know, just figure out the causes and effects and science and break everything down. And that's beautiful for Plato. But Aristotle was into causes. You know, he had the four causes, everything else is four causes, the efficient cause is like the, 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 you know, the building of a table or the, the material cause is the wood that the table comes from. And the, the final cause as well, you know, so that you have something to put things on, but there was this cause that nobody really fully understood called formal cause. And formal cause is like the, the sort of almost the essential cause, the tableness of a table or the humanness of a human. And the, the formal cause of a human is soul, is the soul. that it, It's the only way to understand what is it that makes a human human. It's, it's this almost pre-existing drive and you come in with soul i mean and then you can you can explain it you can use you know quantum field okay so there's quantum field and then human beings are really good at kind of uh, uh you know uh, uh kind of creating a, a a particular you know realization of of uh, infinite quantum spectrum or something you can you can play around with it and there's great scientists who, who will you know kind of back up these ideas but in the end it's it's I used to say, well, there's something soft and squishy and ineffably wonderful about humans. Isn't there some intrinsic weird value that, you know, that human beings can uh, maintain ambiguity over time, you know, that they don't have to resolve things. We can stay in that liminal space between yes and no that computers can't. And we can stay in there and, and we can watch a David Lynch film and not understand what it means and still experience that as pleasurable. You know, what is that unresolved place? And then... You know, I, then I had to realize, you know, in the end, when push comes to shove, I, I, I can't. Those are 
beating around the bush that I do have to come back and finally say, you know, yes, there is, I don't know if there's God as such, but there's a soul. There's something animating this whole thing. And soul came before matter. Soul, you know, it, it really did. Time came before stuff. You know, it's not that we had a bang that created time. No, I think time generated the bang, the soul, that, that, that there was consciousness before Consciousness is not an emergent phenomenon of complicated matter. You know, matter can get complex enough that it can tap into consciousness, that we can broadcast it. You know, I'm more into the sort of the Terence McKenna idea of uh, DNA being like uh, radio antennas, and then we can kind of channel consciousness. But uh, there's a soul, sorry. And soul is always the thing that gets repressed in capitalism. Not just the soul, but soul itself. And you try to jam soul into, oh, let's create a record label that has lots of that soul in it so we can make money off it. It's always, um, it's the only vital force really that we've got as humans is soul. Gabor Mate, the sort of addiction expert, said like that, you know, I, I said what, I asked why, why the insistence of like, you know, why you think they're so anti sort of spiritual or, you know, religious principles. And he said, because if people had souls, you couldn't treat them like that. You know, if we, if we accepted that human beings have something essential and beautiful, then you, you can't have homelessness. You can't you, know, you can't right. have kids down copper mines. You, you can't do that anymore. Right. And, you know, the interesting thing is I seeing it. Pictures don't convey soul for some reason. I, I was I was really interested when, um, you know, they're doing all this mean stuff to like uh, uh, immigrant children coming up from Mexico and sticking them in detention centers and stuff. And there were all these pictures of it. And when there's pictures of things, the president can say, this is a pic, they can s label what the picture is. Say, oh, these are terrorists from the South. These are MS-13 robbers and rapists and killers. But someone got audio of the kids crying. Oh. And when people heard the audio, <gasps> it happened. And I feel like sound, that's why I love podcasts, sound gets the soul on a level that seeing doesn't do it. Sound somehow, it connects to you physically. You know, there's a vibration that's happening in your body of that <laughs> sound. And uh, I feel like that unifies us in a way that uh, uh, it's gonna be valuable. It's very hard as we have as you also say in your book, become increasingly extracted from nature to recognize those cues. Of course, when they happen, as you've just described, we know it. I once was on holiday in Cornwall in the south of England and we played in a place and it was near where, like, I guess, a dairy farm or beef farm or something. And it happened to be the day that they took the calves away from the mothers. And the noise was like, what's that noise? And like someone just said, oh, it's just this is the day that we take the calves away from them. And it was like, the noise was like, well, this doesn't sound like, like a good thing <laughs> for human beings or other mammals to be experiencing. Like these things that tell us that we're off track, that these... <laughs> These systems from agriculture onwards, which are, I suppose, ways of getting big groups of human beings to benefit small groups of human beings, industry, agriculture, technology. Not that there aren't obvious benefits to those systems as well, aside from that. They, in a sense, become the living metaphors for who we are. They We start to eschew any values that prohibit the progress of those particular systems. And in the end, we start to create the dystopia that we are afraid of. We create the hell, the hell of uh, attachment to bad ideas. We we create a landscape where you think, well, maybe the machines should take us over if we're losing, if we have no humanity anyway. you know. But we see it even in modern myth, in sci-fi. How many times do we need to see a bloody machine stomping on a human soul <laughs> or skull in a, like you know, across a barren waste before we sort of recognise, yeah, actually, what are we trying to achieve with this? progress why are we trying to siphon resources and power upwards continually for what for what and partly it's because we don't want to look back i mean i look at all these movies about i mean the robots you know we've enslaved the robots and the robots have a revolution and then they kill the people and i'm like 
this is Hollywood. It's like, this just happened in America. We just had <laughs> slaves. It's like, we don't want to think about reparations for all the black people that we brought over and the slaves and still living in, in housing projects and never been actually dealt with. And that's our recent history. And instead, we're looking forward at this. It's a metaphor for mm. what for what we did. But we end up with this particularly in America, we just go forward, pedal to the metal, you know, <laughs> just keep your blinders on. You know, so we don't have York, we have New York and knew this and knew that. It's everything's new. We're going to keep going, you know, and, and there is no, there, there, we've got to, we've got to look back. We've got to look at what we've, what we've done. And the more we do it, the <laughs> harder it's going to be yeah. to turn around. You know, it's like that Thomas Jefferson described slavery once. He said, it's like having a wolf by the ears. It's a really interesting metaphor because it's like I think that's the way that people feel about all of the just the awful stuff that we've been doing. It's like, well, we can't if we let go, it's just going to bite us on the neck, right? <laughs> yeah, because there would be a sense of power in having a wolf by the ears, but I think I would ultimately think this <laughs> what do you isn't do? right. What I'm doing. <laughs> no, but then what do you? I'm going to let go of the wolf. <laughs> oh no! I'm sorry about the ears thing. Right? Yes. I, I let go. You promise not to bite me. I was like, oh. yeah. Right, that is locked in forever in to, to that idea. But these robots—I mean, that so the, these these nightmares of robots stepping on us. I mean, is is both that and I think you're right though. It's this that we so devalue humans. You know, it's, uh, Norbert Wiener argued about this in the '50s. He wrote a book called *The Human Use of Human Beings*. He was the guy that invented cybernetics, and he said that when this once you know feedback mechanisms yeah, and the, the first study robots, of systems and yeah. And he said, look, you know, we're going to have to be careful because um, if we use machine, if, if, if we teach machines to use us the way we use each other now, all is lost. They're going to do it a lot more efficiently and totally than we do and with no sense of guilt because we've instructed them. They're going to do what we program them to do. So now I've got really two camps that are against humans. I've got the, the singularitans on the one hand who say that let's just evolve out of rise from the chrysalis of matter into pure consciousness and, you know, as if they're going to they can't even program a friggin' b believable travel agent online. And you're gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna trust them to program the next me. I don't, you know, I think not. So they're them on the one hand, but then on the other hand are the environmentalists who will say, well, look, human beings have screwed the whole thing up. We're the problem here. So it's okay if we go extinct. Let's just get rid of us as fast as possible. And uh, I still think human beings are special, that we're, you know, both part of nature and conscious of nature in a way that some other species, maybe any species, you know, no other species is. And we can, you know, really accept our role as the stewards of, of reality on a certain level. But, um, you know, we're just, we're, we're, we, we're so self-loathing right now. And we so devalue ourselves that uh, it's really, it's going to take some massive social therapy. Yes, it's like the... The idea that we could re there's no there's not much enthusiasm or optimism about uh, I heard somewhere it's easier to imagine Armageddon than an end <laughs> to capitalism you know like and it's there's not much optimism for change that that human beings are beautiful and worthy of change and I suppose that makes me feel that there is a significance and an importance to uh, work on the individual that that if you, we create uh, you know over each human being's lifespan if human beings are focused on their their own personal evolution their ability to connect to participate in community their own empowerment without losing that to the egotistical and narcissistic tropes that turn human beings into sort of self ornamenting mm -hmm. lunatics then uh, then they're there is hope for change. You know, like even when you mention those sort of pivotal moments, such as hearing those children crying or when there's sort of sometimes there's a media story that completely transforms public because it like that does suggest an archetypal world, doesn't it? It's something that's so it's like the archetypes line up so perfectly, a material mm -hmm. event so perfectly mimics something that we all understand to be true that we have no choice but to immediately perform an about turn. And right from now, we can't do that anymore. That has to change, you know, mm. so. I do believe, because I, I sense you're optimistic, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I mean, half the reviews of this book are saying, oh, look how insanely optimistic he is. And the other half are saying, oh, look how depressed and <laughs> pessimistic he is. Um, wow. But I, I don't know if I'm optimistic, but I have, I have hope. You know, yeah. I definitely, I'm still, I'm still a hope fiend. I'm still 
um, <laughs> trying to, to retrieve some of the hippie values, you know, that are so disparaged now of, of you know, we can do this. You know, I, I refuse to think of, you know, holding hands around the world and singing Kumbaya as a bad thing, you know? Right, yeah, don't let Coke own that image. Yeah, or or the naysayers, you know, disparage that image, that, that a certain amount of, of naivete is is appropriate right now. I don't know much about Tim Leary or Ram Dass and that sort of mm -hmm. period where American academics became interested in mysticism through psychedelics. Mm -hmm. You are connected to that. Yeah, I mean, and it's interesting. I mean, because in America, they, you know, the, the birthplace of this kind of uh, capitalism, I guess, it's almost like they did need medicine. You know, which is what these things were. Certainly, uh, uh, you know, after they did their mushrooms and stuff, they synthesized, you know, they did Albert Hoffman's LSD and that was the, the molecule, which is much more, much more like a medicine than a message from the planet. You know, you do ayahuasca or mushrooms, there's personality there. There's something talking to you. You do acid and it's just like, you know, going to the, the ideal psychotherapist, you know, white room mirrors of your own psyche. You know, there's no... Uh, there's no message in it other than the echoes of your own, you know, childhood or neuroses or whatever they are. It's a great experience, but it's a different, it's, it's sort of two, I see them as two very, very uh, uh, different, different things where the American uh, movement, I think, kind of fell uh, was, you know, at, at Esalen on the West Coast, they, they really uh, worshipped Maslow. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this idea that, you know, you move up the hierarchy of needs until at the top you have self-actualization. And where self-actualization becomes the goal, it just dovetailed so perfectly with American personal salvation and Protestantism. I'm going to get awakened. It's like, yeah. what do you mean you're going to get awakened? You know, yeah. <laughs> well, what about everybody? You're going to get. You're it's screaming. synonymous with power, isn't it? It's just like, I'm going to become ultimately powerful. It's like it, it's being framed in sort of spiritual language. Right. But it is in essence. Self-help. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. and well, yeah, I understand we need, you need to have enough integrity as an organism to engage with the others. You know, these were not, these were people driving their sobs to Esalen, you know, and sitting in the hot tubs and getting, uh, 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 you know, a little, a little Buddhism between their stock trades, and it was, it, it was a very different, uh, a different thing. And I feel like the the opportunity, some of the opportunity was lost. We're not comfortable with sacrifice, are we? We don't like the idea. That's another thing that Gandhi said in that sort of some speech where he said about the seventy thousand villages. He said, and this is obviously in the forties, however, we're going to have to let go of our attachment to comforts. We're going to have to let go of our attachment to gadgets and trinkets, and. Like, you know, like, otherwise it does just become a commodified spiritual experience where you go to a spa, which, God, what a lovely thought. Mm. Go into a spa, <laughs> hot tub, nice massage, all of these sort of sensual experiences. But if there's not some kind of uh, connection, then what is it really? You know, it becomes somehow quite vapid. Right. I mean, then it's really the, the it's the expression of, of some essential fear. You know, I saw, um, uh, did you see they did the, the, the re-release of 2001, Kubrick? I didn't they, know they, that. they remastered the whole thing. Christopher Nolan like, ah. supervised this project. So you get to see it in like 70 millimeter the way it was oh, wow. originally. And um, I had forgotten, like the whole first third of that movie is like the little monkey people running around and stuff. And there's this <laughs> scene where the monkey people, it's at night and they're sitting like under this little cliff and... They're, they should be sleeping, right? But they're all like this because you hear in the background, hee, hee. You know, there's some saber-toothed tiger walking around and they're just, hee, you know, yeah. waiting for this. And I thought, how many nights over how many hundreds of thousands of years did people sit just like, <gasps> in abject fear? And how deep is that, right? In our in our cellular memory. Huh. So I feel like that fear is, is animating so much of our, okay, I'm going to get a house here. No, now we're going to move to that neighborhood. Now we're going to get more of this. Now I'm going to get a better car. Now I'm going to, you know, that, that it's playing on our, our fear of, of the, the lack of predictability and our fear of the unknown and fear of getting jumped or whatever it is, you know, and it's like, I just want to keep telling people you're safe. It's safe. It's okay. You're safe. And if they felt genuinely safe, mm. then they wouldn't need these other sort of uh, uh, really signifiers of safety. Right. Walls. 
I'm glad we recorded you saying it's safe, it's safe, because I might extract <laughs> that and put it as an app on my phone and just put it on a loop. <laughs> you're safe. <laughs> you're safe. Because you've got a nice way of talking. Plus, you did you were you an actor when you were hanging out with them actors? You're good at doing the yeah. mimes and everything. I was a director. I mean, I was going to do mime a lot. I was I was good in that, but then I just hated mimes as people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to become one of them. <laughs> exactly. I'm not going to do that. But no, I was a theater kid from like 11. You know, I was going to summer stock and doing, I wanted to be, an actor until I realized that the range of roles I could play would be so limited. You know, the, I, maybe I'll get Trepla for something in the seagull. Otherwise I'm going to be nerds, you know, I mean, be <laughs> a little Jewish nerd guy or whatever. And, it, and, and I saw myself on video and acting classes and stuff. I was like, I don't even like the way I look. And I realized that acting is not just cause I, Stanislavski wise or Michael Chekhov wise, I could be there, but it's not just about being there. It's also looking you have to look like someone who's really and i just it doesn't matter that i'm there if my face isn't showing that i'm there it doesn't matter you know that thing we said you know obviously the word archetypes is like coming up in our conversation i was thinking about uh like julie andrews and i thought mm. that twice you know like she you know in like sound of music and mary poppins uh she exemplifies some aspect of uh, womanhood that somehow is resonant and she's able to do it so effectively that we're all you know like uh, entranced hypnotized by it. it made me feel that some actors must have some field or some vibration or resonance that you just think yeah uh, that feels like what that woman would be like an old a super nurturer or a bonding communal matriarchal power right and i see colin firth uh, recently he had he was commanding he was like a naturally commanding person in a very... I thought, oh, I can see why he would play kings, mm -hmm. just the way he walked and stuff. And, and then archetypally, though, then you can also see when people are essentially miscast. Right. Because even if they're great, like, uh, uh, say, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as Great Gatsby, it's like, just wrong. It's just wrong. He's a brilliant actor, but it's not... Because why? What's Gatsby got to have things? I don't know much about that story. Gatsby is a... Uh, uh, Gatsby's an innocent Right, and what we don't buy Leo as an innocent because we've no. he's got no like he's got too much wisdom in his and, face and direction and, right. and he's very he's life for he's vital yeah yeah I see yeah so, so he's not mean? staring across the looking at the green light across the thing wishing for Daisy and you know ah. Gatsby was a was 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 a soft you know thing it was just a different. I see. Person. That's and a Hollywood error to like, yeah. you know, like a, to put the best looking, most successful movie star <laughs> rather than stay true to this idea of essence. Right. I mean, and there's a few people who can kind of, uh, which is interesting, who can move like a, a Meryl Streep or someone who can actually. Yeah. Mutate through different energy fields. And seems. really uh, and somehow and it's just brilliant. But she can then embody an archetype. You know, it's it's. Yes, yes, yes. That's really hard. Now for another mad tangential. Yeah. Uh, uh, but well, but theater wise, pirouette. I was a director. Oh. I was a theater director till I was like so thirty three. Know a lot about story. Yeah, but that was what got me fed up with it. Was was every play had to have an ending? You know, at first it was only the wealthy who were coming. You know, and it's like, what am I going to do? Cultural transformation. You know, I can't do Brecht for the rich. You know, that didn't, <laughs> that didn't work. Brecht for the stinking rich <laughs> wasn't it's satisfying. Like Seventy dollars to see my three penny opera. It's like, it uh, doesn't make doesn't make sense. You know, so and, and then the internet happened, and I was like, oh, this is going to be the people's medium. You know, it was all interactive, and uh, I had it. I had. I thought it would be theatrical. Hmm. But. Which it almost was, but it wasn't. I mean, the CD-ROM era was a little bit, you know, entered into these worlds. And uh, remember the early games like Mist and different screens would come. You'd you'd move around. It was uh, that early kind of virtual reality web was was felt like a, a, an ideal form for a theater director. It was a little architectural maybe, but it was you were moving through spaces, creating experiences. I see. It felt explorative and uh, it could be narrativized rather than sort of a nihilistic, corporatized, right. commodifying threshing machine. <laughs> 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 um, another thing I will yeah. ask you is do like you mentioned in the book uh, 12 step process, the 12 step process. I'm a 12 step person and you talk about it in terms of uh, like we almost need to use an addict model to free ourselves from our attachment to materialism and a, our, our particular type of consumer culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely. First, because the, the platforms we're using are intentionally addictive. 
right? Mm. They take the algorithms from Las Vegas slot machines and put them in our social media feeds. Oh, they literally use those. They literally use it. There's a book called Hooked by Neri Neryal, which is about how to do that. You know, how oh. to create addictive technologies. Where it has to work this many times and then it doesn't work that many times. Like you have to have right. that many hits per pull. Or exactly, something. exactly. You know, you either you find the obsessive rhythm or you, you there's a there's a, a department at Stanford called Captology Department run by BJ Fogg. F O G G. I mean and Captology is exactly what it sounds like. How do you make technologies that Capture, capture people. people and i i met the guy oh my god that's i met the, evil. i what? met the guy who was one of his students who then um who then used those ideas to develop the um the streak feature on snapchat you know where you you show how many days that you've had consistent conversations and like teenage girls are just hooked on it oh we've 107 days if you miss one day we go back down to zero. I was about to feel superior to those teenage <laughs> girls before I realized on my meditation app, like sometimes it, it tells me, and it is 107 days, curiously. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, uh, like, uh, uh, like, and uh, I sort of, even sometimes I meditate without the app. I can meditate. I know yeah. TM. I learned that from the David Lynch uh -huh. Foundation, as a matter of fact. But I feel sort of bound <laughs> to the app. Oh, no, I can't have it go back to one. Well, at least like it's trying to, right. You're trying to use a, and that's fine, using some external thing right. to encourage it. But the the addiction of, uh, I mean, as, as you would know from addiction, addiction works not by satisfying the need, but by not satisfying the need. So you go back. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, your social interactions online, your your uh, Skype conversations and FaceTime, they lack the fidelity that you need to actually connect with another person. But you don't blame the technology for that. You blame the other person. You blame, because we haven't evolved to understand that we're, oh, this is a mediated exchange, so of course I'm not. You know, <laughs> your, your, your body doesn't feel that. But but you, even though you blame them, you end up then addicted. You go back for more. Why didn't it get it? Why didn't I get that? Why didn't it really? I mean, as you know from a drug, it never, it never quite fill. It never quite hits that spot. In 12-step theology the uh, the idea is that the reason it doesn't do that is because the craving that you actually feel is a spiritual one a yearning right. for connection that you and you're using facsimiles and anesthetics to de defer your suffering right because you don't know how to form a meaningful spiritual yep. connection and, and that's a spiritual connection that some of our leading scientists and intellectuals are telling us doesn't exist why are they so determined why is that such a sort of a potent movement even people that i admire and like like the uh cosmologist brian uh, cox like mm -hmm. he sort of like he always sort of starts off saying like you know sort of uh, science is not the domain of uh, spirituality and like i'm cool with everything but then later in like he says stuff like uh you know, if you can't measure it, it's not there. Right. They're, they're like, you know, and like we because, know every bit of energy that's in an because arm. Because these scientists, just like today's economists who are trapped in 13th century economic uh, uh, operating systems, today's scientists are trapped in Francis Bacon's style reductionist science, breaking it apart. So you look at the human in terms of their pieces, but you don't have any sense of the vital whole. You know, so if you if you if you understand anatomy as or the human being as the liver and the this and the that, you miss the whole thing. I mean, only now are doctors starting to realize, oh, the connective tissue is actually where it's at. All right. You know, because if you said, I, I really want to meet Marlon Brando and then someone goes, yeah, all right. And then they bought in his foot and then one of his <laughs> kidneys, <laughs> and there's one of his balls, <laughs> some hair we shaved off him. We're going to get all of him. No, I want the experience of Brando. Right. Yeah. Or you get the movie, you know, yeah. which again is not, uh, it's a, it's a, that's why we've got to, and I do think that's what it comes down to is standing up for that there is an assen, there is something essential about human. Again, the intellectuals, they were, they were giving me crap years ago. They said, oh, that's essentialist. I was mm -hmm. arguing something. And it was like, it's this bad thing. And it's like, oh, what, that there, 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 there's essence. Why is that <laughs> the bad thing? But yeah, it's a, it's a, a kind of Are they science. afraid of love? What are they afraid of? Right, but if you read, and I, I quoted him in there, it's the only person I've really quoted in this book, Francis Bacon, when he invented the scientific revolution, he's talking about nature as this woman that you you hold down and rape. That, oh, that's, Francis, that, that's, mate, no. But that's what science was. <laughs> We're going to the, she will, you know, nature, she will submit to us. You Ooh, know, that's the wrong attitude. Get in harmony with nature. Right. 
Francis was right, and so that in within it is the idea of dominion. Although that is also a religious idea. It's it right. say man gave you know God gave man dominion over the beast. But like uh, that in itself, I'm sure was being utilised. That's a repurposing of religious ideas. Oh, yeah. You know, I, one thing I would want to say that, to you know, like atheist materialist people that believe solely or primarily in mecha mechanical models is I want to say when people believe the earth was flat when people believe the sun went around the earth like that you know what do you know, they really believed that what do you imagine are the beliefs that we currently hold that we will learn what illusory and temporary my assumption is that we will learn that consciousness itself operates in ways that we can't understand that it connects us to one another that it can transmit and receive information that we don't understand that it can't be fabricated and created not you know intelligence is one thing consciousness is another and um, and i feel that why would we want to like why not live as if there is essence why not live as if there is god why not live as if beauty and love are th things to aspire to and i suppose because if you do all that you challenge the interests of the powerful you start to dismantle right. corporations nation states privileged elites that is one of the things that would definitely happen and i think it might be the defining thing that prevents new narratives emerging that empower human beings that stop us competing through the illusory temporary individualized motifs and models of what it is to be human instead of team humans yeah and i think people eventually that's what we'll realize is that oh my god we thought we were individuals ah isn't that yeah. funny remember back when people thought that they were yeah. individual that you know remember back when people thought that lying worked yeah, you know yeah. i really i don't i don't believe in lying anymore i mean i saw one of those stage performers who can then tell who's lying about what you know no those way. guys so there are these people you know and they'll you know they'll know who's holding the right card i mean and it's not magic they'll they because they they're can accused. see yeah they're cues and all that and i thought well if this guy's figured out what the cues are then subconsciously we probably all know when yeah. someone's lying so if everybody knows when everybody's lying then why lie <laughs> you know <laughs> they know it anyway they know and and could you imagine if everybody realized that everybody knew everything, that there was no cheating, you couldn't cheat on your spouse, you couldn't cheat on your taxes, or whatever it was, you couldn't even lie to a person. It would, like All of a sudden it would be horrifying but liberating. Yes, it's sort of beautiful. And again, it's a sort of a, a, a spiritual idea that I've been taught that if you've done something in bad faith, if you have uh, reneged on an agreement with someone that you love or cheated or whatever, the fact that they don't know it, that, that doesn't mean you haven't sort of soiled the space between you, their sort of pool that you, the two of you right. exist in. So that becomes, again, a sort of a, a, an acknowledgement of your own essence and their essence and a kind of requirement for truth, a requirement for fidelity in the you know literal sense of the word, of a kind of faithfulness, mm -hmm. of walk the line, find the frequency, connect to it, remain with it. Right, and this is where I kind of gone from almost a Jewish outlook to a more Christian one. Ooh. That I loved the Jewish outlook of, well, we got text, you know, Judaism was really a reaction in some ways to, <laughs> to the written word. It's, we're going to have this revolution. We're going to have the axial age. We're going to have agriculture and we're going to stop wandering around. And what are the ethics going to be if people own land and people have crops and, and time and oh my gosh. But <laughs> but they they came up. That was with a very good Jewish <laughs> mime of the Jewish people realizing they were going to have to have Oh, <laughs> oh no. Oi, really hey, ethics. <laughs> but they, they, they sat down. I mean, Moses and his brother-in-law or his father-in-law, uh, Yithro, they sat and they started writing the law. Right? And this was sort of the beginning of Talmud. But what the Jews thought was, all right, we want to have an ethical world. So let's figure out what are the ethics of every situation and come up with all these laws. And then Jesus finally came along and said, look, 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 that's really sweet. That's beautiful. <laughs> you try that. but, but I got an easy, just act out of it. Just, you know, be loving. Just do that. And I'm starting to think that that's really, that we can't codify it. There is no blockchain, you know, for <laughs> universal justice. That it's got to come from people just being nice. Yes, because it, once you start to assume in order to then it's, it immediately returns to the previous template that right. is the one that we're tyrannized by inwardly and externally. Right. I mean, it is great. I mean, what the what the Jews did get, a great one from, from Talmud, the uh, the rabbis got, they used to get these letters and they would try to answer them. It was like, a, you know, a call in radio. And someone wrote to the rabbis and said, um, what's the real reason to do, um, um, what's the real reason to read Torah? Is it to make us more ethical people or is it to remember the history of, of the Israelites? And they argued and argued, and then finally, like the smart rabbi, Akiva, whatever he is, finally said, no, the, the reason to read Torah is lishma, for its own sake. 
you know, you read Torah to read Torah, and then all, and then you can apply that to everything. Yeah. You know, you don't do anything for some. You do it. Mm, that's very and, zen. Yeah. Be in the the way is the way. Don't start thinking about oh, I might get this. I find it very hard to. Uh, I don't know how much of that is. Um, I suppose in all senses, it's a combination that our conditioning, our cultural conditioning, has utilised inner energies to the point where they are in relationship. That the individual is enmeshed in these systems now. Because I personally is like find it I, it takes conscious effort to not think oh i might be able to get something out of that oh i hope that may, made me look good or attractive or i'll get a free pair of shoes like it's sort of it's somehow the, the, that's embedded now and i yeah. have to work against it right well i think it's it's it is true for pain you know if you're in there's a splinter in your hand i'm gonna pull it out so that i feel better mm. you know and that's where oh. buddha understood that you know all this human striving is because we're in pain and trying to get out of pain you know and now we're really confused because we're so comfortable in the west or a lot of us are and we still <laughs> we're still in pain so it's like, <laughs> wait a minute that's not what i thought oh, it not worked you tricked us <laughs> right hmm uh, I, Douglas, I think it's been a really, really wonderful mm. conversation. I've learned a great deal from you. I oh, feel I like uh, your students are very lucky to have you as a teacher, and I reckon they should stop getting them notes. And you should <laughs> Robin Williams their asses onto the table with some proper Captain My Captain <laughs> action. Go. Yeah. Get them out there. Thank you very much. That was a lovely conversation. Thank you. Team Humans, this book, you can get it if you want. Like, you know how to get it by using yeah. algorithms. And yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, none of us are safe from these uh, all-consuming systems. But that doesn't mean that there isn't truth, or essence, and beauty, and that we couldn't one day topple them somehow. We work on that. Yeah, the there's still fun days. to be had in them. Of course there bloody well is. <laughs> Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. Cheers, man. Thanks for watching this podcast and going all the way to the end of it. It was usually kind of to click the bell. It might not be there, because over there. And uh, subscribing so that we can infiltrate your serenity and peace of mind with jangling bells and buzzes. Thank you. <laughs>